It is now 10 o'clock in the morning, the first main business meeting of the 80th World Science Fiction Convention will be in order. First, before we get started, I'm going to recognize the Deputy Presiding Officer for a moment of privilege. Hey everyone, good morning. Um, so we've had some issues yesterday uh, with, I know that all, a lot of us haven't seen each other since 2018 or before, and we all love to chat and that there's often downtime when folks are walking up to the microphone. However, we have a captioner here who is doing an amazing job um, of recording um, our business and helping those who uh, have access needs to understand what's going on as well as helping all of us because I know it's helpful for, for everyone to be able to, to have that written record right in front of us. And the amount of chatter is making it difficult for her to actually hear what's going on. So especially if you are in the house right section of the room sitting behind the captioner, please do not be chatting to the folks next to you. Um, even when folks are walking up to the microphone, because inevitably you don't stop talking the second they start talking. And please be respectful um, and aware of the impact that that's having um, on folks with access needs. Thank you. And as a segue for that, if you're going to speak, as in use the microphone, please sit close to the microphone. That gives less time for people to begin chattering while you are walking to the microphone. Okay? Good. Now, I am Jared Dashoff. I use he, him pronouns, and I am your presiding officer for today, and tomorrow, and probably Monday. This is Jesse Lift. They use they, them pronouns. They are the deputy presiding officer. Beginning on the far end of the table is the timekeeper, Todd Dashoff, he, him. The parliamentarian, Don Eastlake III, he, him. Linda Deneroff, our secretary, she, her. And in the back is Lisa Hayes, our videographer, she, her. And Kevin Stanley, our assistant videographer, he, him. And up here in the front, uh, is Martin Pine, our floor manager. He will run you the microphone if you cannot come to the microphone. If you are able to come to the microphone, please come to the microphone from a short distance because you are sitting next to the microphone. 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 Era. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could you please note the pink slips for people who are on the I was just getting there. Yes, Martin has pink slips and there are some in the back. If you cannot come to the microphone, if you have access needs, please, when you are coming in, grab a pink piece of paper. That will show Martin that he needs to run the microphone to you. Okay? Good. This meeting is being recorded in accordance with the standing rules. You will likely appear on the recording, especially if you talk. Uh, the recordings will be posted to the Worldcon events channel on YouTube, and I believe that yesterday's recording is already on the channel, as is the second version of yesterday's uh, recording, because we have two cameras running, just in case one doesn't work. Uh, when you're coming in, please note your attendance on the attendance sheets, Pick up a business meeting ribbon in the back. There are also other various business meeting associated ribbons back there. Uh, please silence any sound making devices that include cell phones, beepers, pagers, small children, I don't know, knees, mind creep, so who knows. Um, our cart services today are provided by a grant from Google. Uh, if you are speaking, please come to the microphone and speak into it. State your, pro your name and your pronouns, and then begin your speech. Your speech should be directed to the chair, 
but you should be facing the audience. Here is your daily reminder, debate need not be factual, it must be civil. If you do not wish to state your pronouns, that's fine. If you misgender someone or make a joke about pronouns, you will be ruled out of order. After you are done speaking, if you have not spoken already, please both go to the secretary and show her your badge so that she can make sure she's got your name correctly. And the cart operator has a small piece of paper. Um, if you plan on speaking after the first time you've spoken, please put your name down there so our cart operator can spell your name correctly. All right. Today, we are going to handle the Market Protection Committee election. Then we will begin with the standing rules changes, which we did not get to yesterday. Okay, I have reminded the presiding officer that at the end of yesterday, he said that we would be starting with D5 and 6, the two resolutions that we did not get to since we had started with D1 through 4, and then doing standing rules changes, and that since that's what he said we would be doing, that's what we should do. Thank you for having the break. So we will begin with the resolutions for D5 and 6. Then we will move to section C, which is the standing rules changes. Then we will move to section E, if we have time. And if we're really lucky and really good, we all get cookies and we get to go to section F. Since we are going to handle the resolutions immediately after the Mark Protection Committee election, I'm going to make this ruling now. The rule, the motion to object to consideration and postpone indefinitely are both going to be in order as we usually handle resolutions at the preliminary business meeting where both of those are in order and because of yesterday's delays, they are happening today. Good, there's no objection. All right, so now we're gonna begin with the Mark Protection Committee election. Nominations were accepted yesterday. There are five names on the ballot. There are actually four names on the ballot. There were five nominees. One of the nominations was not accepted um, by the person who was nominated. So there are four names on the ballot. The ballot is run by Australian ballot system. That means that you rank everybody on the ballot one through four. Put a number next to everyone's name, please. Martin. Martin Pine, he, him, I believe this is technically a question of privilege. I just wanted to note that the voting form says vote for three of the following. You should fill out the form the way Mr. Ch members, should, members should fill out the form the way that Mr. Chairman just stated and not check boxes next to three members. Yes. Only the top three vote getters will be elected to the Mark Protection Committee, but you can vote for all four because math. All right, Martin, can you hand out the ballots, please? If you need pens, please find one in your neighbor's pocket. Um, I'm also going to need volunteers to count the votes. Do I have any volunteers? Andrew Adams, are you volunteering with your hat? Yes. Yes. And Jean, so Andrew and Jean, I think two should suffice, but if you feel you need more help, you can grab someone else.
Kevin. Parliamentary inquiry. Uh, I believe this is something, given what's happened in the last couple of these elections, I've noted, I think the tellers are supposed to include the full ballot results, not just the winners, and provide the whole ballot break, voting breakdown to the secretary. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bad Kevin. Kevin Stanley, he him. When you have completed your ballot, please fold it in half, hamburger style. We all know what that means, right? No. 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 Across the length, uh, across this way, that way, and then pass them to the aisles so that the tellers can collect them. Does any member still require a ballot? Has anybody not received a ballot? Please raise your hand. Seeing and hearing nobody, I'm going to assume everyone has a ballot. Has any member not not returned their ballot? Has any member not put their ballot in the hat or given to somebody who put the ballot in the hat? closing the polls at this time. Seeing none, the tellers can start counting out in the hall. I think it's on the table talk. All right. We are now going to move to resolution D5, Solidarity with Ukraine. Is one of the makers of the motion in the room? Chuck. Yes. Would you like to give a speech in favor of the resolution? Yes, I would. Debate time is four minutes. Please come to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Chuck Surface. 
um, pronouns he him. Yeah, I haven't told her go water. Pronouns he him. I am a returned Peace Corps volunteer, 2008, 2010. I was part of teaching English as a foreign language group, service country, Ukraine. Um, my, my former students in Ukraine tell me how important science fiction and science fiction literature is becoming in their life. I saw that begin to grow as I was teaching various classes in Ukraine. At this point, we would ask, and I actually wrote this down because I'm very nervous in front of people. My Ukrainian friends would ask you to remember that Ukraine is an ancient and wonderful land. Ukrainians are kind and welcoming people. Ukraine is a young country, Our, their fandom is growing, their love of literature, science fiction, and, and space flight strong, uh, their conventions are pleasant. They ask for solidarity among all fans. This is not about China specifically. We recognize the energy that Chinese fans have. We recognize the excellent work they're putting in toward their convention for next year. But fans who allow the uh, Worldcom platform or champion the illegal invasion of Ukraine should know that this is not right. Fandom is about friendship, not a space for fascists to go and gloat. I ask you to support Ukraine as point it supports the civilized. Kevin, will you rise for a point of order? Kevin Stanley, I believe the speech is not germane to the question before the meeting. I believe the member is debating item D5. Uh, D6, rather. I. This is D5 before us. I'm going to rule that point of order not well taken. I think that given the language in D5 and the speech, that everything the member has said so far is germane to D5. I would finish by asking you to support Ukraine as it supports a civilized and democratic approach to this matter as we all should. Thank you very much. Ben, you wish to speak against the motion? Ben Yellow, he, him. I'm not going to speak in general to the merits of the situation in the Ukraine. What I'm going to speak to is that I believe that this body, the Worldcon business meeting, WISPUS, is and should not be involved in real world political considerations. If we look at Article 1, it is very clear that it talks about science fiction, the item that unifies all of us. Real world politics has no business in WISPUS, and I therefore, regardless, and I am not absolutely challenging the prior speaker's claims concerning the merits of the current situation in the Ukraine. I am absolutely not. What I am saying is that this is not the business of WISPUS. Olav, I saw you first. Olav Rockney, he, him. Um, there is no such thing as neutrality when it comes to atrocities. Silence in this matter always stands with the status quo and always, always platforms and empowers the violent. Mary Ann, do you wish to speak again to the motion? Come to the microphone. Perry Ann Murray, she, her. Uh, I, would, I would move to strike the word fascist. Scotland's law says you should never do that. Uh, just been invaded, period. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. How much time is left? Uh, was that a speech in favor or is that you? That was against. A motion to amend is a speech against. Yes. Thirty seconds in favor and twenty-five seconds against. Move to the time. By how long? Two minutes. 
Second. Is there any objection to extending time for debate by two minutes? One minute for each side. Seeing none, that time is extended. Perry Ann, do you wish to make a speech in favor of your amendment? Is there any speech against the amendment? My name is Vivian Abraham. I'll use any pronouns. Um, I think that we should call the spade a spade. Uh, I think that uh, Godwin's law aside, so we're not referring to a particular group of fascists. We refer, we're not referring to Nazis, but fascism exists and is strong in every country right now around the world, including ours. We need to call it out when we see it. Is there a speech in favor of the amendment? Joni, for what purpose are you? May I offer No, second order amendments are not in order. Speech in favor? Nicolai uh, Clark, here. Uh, the, the, the removing the word fascism uh, makes the motion clearer while condemning the violence without getting into he said, she said, etc. match about terminology, which can easily be used by aggressors to undermine the fundamental point of the motion. This is why I support the amendment as stated. Thank you. Is there a motion against the amendment? Speech. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Over here. Alan Tipper, they, them. As stated, the amendment would leave the word by hanging. In other words, yeah, amendment, not quite, not quite there. It, yes, the speech is, well, debate need not be factual. Um, <laughs> is there a speech in favor of the amendment? Any more speeches against the amendment? Ira. My name is Ira Alexandra, pronouns they, them. I am Russian-Ukrainian. The less we name what is happening, the more power it will have over us. I'm going to ask for a time check. Kate Secor, she, her. Look, I don't think 
think there's anyone in this can you, room. Can you move just a little closer to the microphone? Yeah, sorry, is that better? Oh, wow, yeah, okay. I don't think there's anyone in this room who's sitting here going, yeah, fascist invasions are awesome, right? We're all sitting here going, this is terrible, and it should never have happened. But I have to agree that as written, that resolution has nothing to do with Worldcon, has nothing to do with fandom, has nothing to do with anything that is the proper purview of this meeting. So we've already put it on the agenda. We've already gone on video and on record saying, fascism bad, invasions bad, we support the Ukrainians. But I don't think that this measure should be in the agenda. And I don't think that we should be voting on it because we don't have the purview to do so. If we want to show our support, there are other ways to do it and other ways that will be more substantive and make more of a difference. And that's all. Thank you. Members are reminded that A, they should not stand until after the previous speaker has stood, and also I would ask that they wait until I've asked for the next speaker. That way I know you're at, wishing to speak either in favor or against whichever time it is, or if you are attempting to raise a point of order. If you are raising a point of order or of parliamentary privilege, then you can pop up before I ask for a speech. That will help me figure out what you want to do. Is there any member wishing to speak in favor? Alex. Alex, Bax, Alex, Alex, they, them. I just want to make two points of disagreement with my esteemed colleagues, Ben Yellow and Kate Secor, is that Science fiction, as is all art, is inherently political, and pretending that we are neutral ground is unfortunately not a well-founded point. And secondly, we, it is our purview because we are human beings. Is there any member wishing to speak against the resolution? Elspeth. One second. Elspeth Pilbar, she, her. Kate has an excellent point. She has saved me the time of speaking and saved the time of Parliament as a timekeeper. Thank you. <laughs> um, the business meeting does not have. I fully agree that the situation is atrocious. I fully agree in supporting it. Um, and on a practical level, if we start doing this, well, it's Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and... Why more Mr. Chair? Cliff. Mr. Chair, Cliff Dunn. Since I believe two or three people have raised this point, I would like to, the Chair, to rule on point of order as to whether this is ultra virus. Outside of the body, therefore, we cannot, we do not have the power to debate it. That's what ultra virus means. No, I have to make a ruling first. Given that there is precedent for this body uh, making resolutions of continuing effect on things not relating directly to science fiction, 
i.e. Pluto, Pluto not being a planet anymore. I'm going to say that this resolution is within the purview of this body. Mr. Chair, with the utmost respect, I move to appeal the decision. Is there a second? Okay, there is a second to appeal the decision of the chair. So how this works is I get to give a speech and then a speech again. Point of information, yes. Jason Spencer. One of my esteemed colleagues pointed out that it is the 16th word, Ukrainian fans, fans being the 16th word. So as for your decision... I'm going to rule that out of order. My, well, my question was just, isn't any issue of fans within our... It's, I've already ruled that the, speak, the resolution is within the purview of the body. There has been a motion to appeal the decision of the chair. I am not going to back up the decision or the ruling that I made, which already agrees with your point, therefore your point is out of order. Fair enough. Todd. Todd Dash off he him. Does the time we now spend discussing the appeal of the ruling of the chair come off the time of the motion? Yes. In which case there are 17 seconds left, period. Good, then I get to say, the word fans is in the resolution. We've already passed a resolution noting that Pluto is no longer a planet, condemning it. So this is no farther away from Wispus business than that is. Therefore, it is within the purview of this body. There being no time remaining, <laughs> I'm going to put the appeal of the chair to the body. The form of the motion is, should the ruling of the chair be sustained? Therefore, if you vote in favor, you are saying, I am right. If you vote against, you are saying, I am wrong. All those in favor of sustaining the, the ruling of the chair, please raise your hands. Thank you. All those opposed? The ayes have it. We are now going to vote on the underlying resolution as time has expired. All those in favor, yeah. all those in favor of the resolution as printed in the packet since we did not amend it, please raise your hands. All those opposed, I'm going to say the ayes have it. Moving on to D.6. The debate time is again four minutes. Is there any... Make Alex, for what purpose does the member rise? That's a very good question. Yeah. Is there anyone seconding the objection to consideration? Yep. So this requires a three-fourths vote in favor? Yes. So there is not debatable. There's no time. So we're just going to go right to the vote. So. Objecting to consideration means that we technically never took up this resolution. Postponing indefinitely would mean that we took it up and pushed it off till the end of time. Objecting to consideration means we don't even think it should be debated. All those in favor of objecting to consideration, please raise your hands. All those opposed? I'm going to say the no's have it. The motion fails. Ben. I rise to appoint the order. 
Uh, section 1-6 of the Constitution very clearly delineates the split in responsibilities between WISPIS, which is us, and the Convention Committee. And it specifically says things such as site selection, etc., are on the WISPIS side. It also says rather explicitly that everything else is the responsibility solely of the Convention Committee, and WISPIS has no business discussing it. Therefore, I believe that there is a clear, bright line that says that it is not within the power of WISPIS to attempt to influence the Convention Committee in an area that is explicitly not allowed by the Constitution. This is an attempt by WISPIS to influence the Convention Committee where it is prohibited from going and WISPIS has no business under its own rules trying to deal with this issue. The chair is going to rule the point of order not well taken. The language in 1.6 states authority and responsibility for all matters concerning blah, 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 blah. This resolution does not take authority or responsibility as it does not ask for any direct action. And I appeal the ruling of the chair. All right. Point of order. Has the motion been sec appeal been seconded? The word ask. This is this is my speech in favor, by the way. I work in communications for the federal government. I know that that has all types of connotations, but the word ask does not take responsibility. If the motion, if the resolution were stating the, or calling to, yes, if the resolution were removing the named person as the guest of honor, I would definitely rule the motion out of order, or the resolution out of order, because this body cannot remove a guest of honor. However, asking the convention committee to remove the guest of honor is not out of order. Is there a speech against the ruling of the chair? Ben. I agree completely that trying to make it mandatory would clearly be on the wrong side of the line. I believe that the line is drawn not at the requiring us to do something totally unconstitutional, but attempting to persuade us to do something that is totally unconstitutional. And we are asking something unconstitutional to be done. And therefore, I believe the bright line is attempting to influence rather than attempting to mandate, particularly when we know that mandating is utterly improbable and prohibited by our rules. Andrew. Is there a member wishing to speak in favor? Terry. If the business meeting cannot Terry, can you I'm sorry, that? Terry, Neil, she, her. If the business meeting cannot request 
that committees do do or don't do something that we feel strongly about. Um, what the hell are we here for? We cannot dictate to a committee, and I absolutely agree with Ben on that, but we can certainly ask them to take our opinion into consideration. Thank you. I'm going to look to the back. Is, do we need to stop for a swap? Yes. Oh, well, let's, while we're at a break between speeches, let's do the swap now. So we're going to take a... All right, so that was a speech in favor of the chair's ruling. Is there a speech against Elspeth? Elspeth Cohort, she heard the chairman of which is this meeting has stated his credentials. I won't bother stating mine. By asking, we are trying to influence the um, Worldcon Committee. Trying to influence in this fashion, influence is very, very close the same meaning as ask. Therefore, by asking, or by, we are trying, whichever word we we are trying to influence a Worldcon committee. And by trying to influence, we are, in effect, asking it. And we are not allowed to do that, folks. That's not why we're here. And so, I am speaking very firmly against the chair's ruling. He may have all sorts of outside world. wishing to speak in favor of the chair's ruling. Cliff, are you wishing to speak in favor? Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, Cliff Dunn, male pronouns. Uh, I am very concerned about the idea that removing a guest of honor is somehow unconstitutional, because that is all this is asking for a confound to do. Was it unconstitutional that when this room to guest of honor? I think that was not objected to, at least on constitutional grounds. So if we were asking the convention to violate 501c3 status, which is required, or to otherwise explicitly violate the Constitution, that would be one thing. But we are asking them to explicitly do something that is clearly within their remit. I don't think that's improper. All right. So time has, been, time has expired for both sides. The chair gets to make one final statement. I'm not going to use that time because we're going to move things along here. And so all, again, the question is in the form of should the ruling of the chair be sustained that this, is, this resolution is not out of order? All those in favor of sustaining the chair's ruling, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed? I'm going to say the ayes have it. Since time has expired on the underlying resolution, I'm going to put that to the body. I feel the room of the chair based on standing rule 3.5. Hi, he, him. Standing Rule 3.5 states that if debate time has expired before either or both sides of the question have had an opportunity for substantive debate, each side should have, each side that has not had an opportunity shall have two minutes for this purpose of substantive debate. I would argue that none of that discussion constituted substantive debate on the underlying resolution, therefore I feel the ruling of the chair. Second. I'm going to rule that point in order, so we're going to have two minutes of debate. 
on each side. I, I can get there. I just needed to take a breath. Um, is there a member wishing to speak in favor of the resolution? James Bacon as a named maker of the motion or resolution. My name is James Bacon. My pronouns are he, him. I hope that Chengdu fans and Chinese fans have an absolutely amazing World Cup. I'm sure it's going to be really wonderful. But it's very sad that we're forced to use this democratic process, which is available to us, to speak, seek support against those who would politicize Worldcon. Ukrainians didn't politicize Worldcon. When a Worldcon guest of honor says terribly, absolutely reprehensible things about a whole nation, they have politicized the Worldcon. All we can do is say, that is right, that is wrong. And we can stand here and say, as a Worldcon guest of honor, something should be done. And what we can do is say, the spirit of this room is that something should be done about this guest of honor. We politely ask. We don't tell. It's just about saying this is wrong. It's absolutely terrible for any convention committee when a Worldcon guest of honor goes wrong. But there's never been a Worldcon guest of honor who's gone as wrong as this guest of honor. To encourage and want a country invaded, to want people liquidated, to call them Nazis? This is unbelievable stuff. And then all we say here is, this is wrong. Please refuse this person. He shouldn't be part of our community. And he definitely shouldn't be a world con guest of honor, which brings shame to us all. Is there a speech against the resolution? Mr. Chairman, I'm Rafe Richards, he, him, pronouns. I am not here to defend Sergei Lukienko, far from it. What I would say is, this motion verges into criticizing Chengdu for their decision. It has been deemed that we have the power to do it. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. What, what I foresee from this happening is that the next business meeting, perhaps, criticizes Glasgow for picking a guest of honor who is in favor of Taiwanese independence or one supported free Tibet. In Glasgow, we end up attempting to overturn that censure, and maybe we censure 2025 for appointed guest of honor who, I don't know, once voted Republican. Where does it stop? Worldcon is a world convention. That means sometimes it goes to countries who do politics differently. If we don't like that, we need to not give them the conventions. We don't attempt to criticize them in advance because otherwise, it just never stops. Thank you. Is there a speech in fit? Mr. Garcia. Chris Garcia, he, short and sweet. Awards and honorships are about values. What we as a community value. If we do not say what we value, they are not real. They're not important. We need to take a stand where our beliefs lie. Even if those beliefs may not be universal, this room, you, have values. Let's express them. Is there a speech against the resolution? Elspeth. She, her. I accept the chair's ruling, however, he's made an excellent argument in the process. He's used Pluto as a precedent for our not being allowed to do this. By doing this, we are setting a precedent and other people can appeal to it and can use it as an argument for whatever they're doing. So, actually, thank you, Jared, because you made an excellent point about precedent. So therefore, I'm against setting a precedent. Is there a, is there time remaining in favor of the resolution? There's six seconds remaining in favor and 16. Six seconds in favor, 16 against. Is 
there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the resolution? Lou. Martin, can you run the microphone to Lou? Lou Wolkoff, he, him, I'll spell my name to you later. Um, um, we don't know who the speakers are going to be, the honorees are going to be until after we vote, so we can't criticize before. Imagine if a white nationalist had been announced here. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the resolution? Ben. Benny Allo, he, him, I think, should this resolution pass, we are opening a can of worms that will never, ever, ever shut. And that will be bad for family as a community. Time had on, for debate on the resolution has expired. I will now put the question to the floor. All those in favor of Resolution D6, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed, I'm going to say the ayes have it. Andrew, are you back? Okay, we're going to now take a break in the business to hear the results of the MPC election. he, him, the results of the Mark Protection Committee election after the preferential voting. Kevin Stanley, Ben Yellow and Nicholas White uh, are elected to the MPC. The tellers are thanked for their work and I will, do I have a motion to destroy the ballot? to destroy the ballots? Seeing none, the tellers are instructed to destroy the ballots. All right, we're going to move now to the standing rules changes beginning with C.1. on page two of the shortened agenda and on page 29 of the, or sorry 28 of the PDF of the extended agenda. Time for debate was set at 10 minutes. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the standing rules change? Cliff. Constitution. 
because, after all, we have taken to referring almost all constitutional uh, amendments, at least regarding the Hugo categories and the many Hugo categories, to committee, not to mention the situation that occurred with the Nitpicking and Flyspecking Committee, where something had to be bounced back to them, I believe, twice due to uh, issues that it, where they needed the Mrs. Beam's feedback, clearly. So I would ask this body to adopt this motion. A motion to amend? Elspeth Cover, um, I would like to include, if possible, to offer hard copy as well as electronic. That's not decided. That's C2. Uh, sorry, I was trying to, I thought I was amending Cliff's motion. It, Cliff made both motions, but this is C1. On okay. Help me out when it's time. Yes. <laughs> Is there a member wishing to speak against this new rule change? Move to amend? Yes. Thank you. 
Jonathan, when I see him. Um, while I, I take the idea of the main motion well, I think the problem with the amendment as written is that it would seem to preclude, by saying may only be referred back to committee, it would seem to preclude the ability of the body to say, no, we're not interested, go away entirely, which I think is a, should be a valid option for the committee, for, for the meeting. Is there a speech in favor of the amendment? Any speeches against the amendment? Seeing none, we're going to vote on the amendment. Do I need to? Elspeth, for what purpose are you rising? You want to speak against them? We just have a speak against? We, yeah. All right. Do I need to restate the amend the text? All right. Yeah. We are currently voting on an amendment to resolution or standing rules change C1, such that the last sentence will read: "These shall be listed under new business and treated as other main motions, but the result of the debate." may only be referred to committee. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hands. All right, hands down, all those in favor, or all those against? I'm going to say the ayes have it. All right, everybody, it's serpentine time. <laughs> Here's how this works. We're going to call, I'm going to call for all those in favor. If you can stand, please stand in your seat. If you cannot stand, please raise your hand. We're, or your pink slip in your hand. We're going to start on this end, go down the first row. When we get to Terry, however Terry is voting, Oh. All right, I've been instructed to do it by section. So we're going to weave through a section, then to the middle, then to the far left. Yes, and the head table. So, and then we'll repeat the whole process for those against. When you get called on, count off by number. So the first person will be one, two, three, four. All right, we all know how to count? Good. All those in favor, please stand.
52 against, 34 in favor, so the 38, regardless, the no's have it. So the, rest, or the standing rules change is not amended. I know what I'm doing. Do you all know what you're doing? No. <laughs> All right, how much time is left on the underlying standing rules change? For the affirmative, two minutes, 41 seconds. For the negative, four minutes. Call the question. Second. There is a motion to call the question and a second. Is there any objection to calling the question? Yes. yes. All right. This is not going to be all, right? <laughs> all those in favor of... Okay. Are there any people who didn't object who also want to talk on the underlying standing rules change? Seeing none. What? Okay. So there, there are at least one person wishing to speak and numerous objections to calling the question. Yes. I, I'm group, grouping those two groups together. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hands. All right. All those opposed? I'm going to say... I'm going to say the no's have it. All right. I think we're on a speech in favor. I know you want to... Joshua. He, him. Well, I think this motion could use amendment. It is, it is important for a committee to be able to bring things to the floor and have substantial debate on them without bringing this body into disrepute dis by bringing things to, um, to the floor in the fashion that appears as if we were going to pass them that may have substantial errors and may need more work. Um, by having a, a way for a committee to bring things to the floor that by default will not pass if this body works on them and passes them, this allows for this to happen. We do, don't currently have a way to do this, and we should. Is there a member wishing? Members are reminded that they should wait until I've asked for the next speech unless they are arising for point of order or parliamentary privilege. Is there a member wishing to speak against the standing rules change? Don. You can just use the microphone in front of you if you want. Yeah, just pull it a little closer. There you go. Okay. All these like yeah. Uh, so, in my opinion, can you get closer to the mic, please? Sure. Thank you. Closer to me. How's that? That's better. Okay. Uh, so, in my opinion, this motion is not necessary because the committee could always report back uh, to the business meeting a motion in the form uh, that the, basically moved to the business meeting allow 10 minutes to discuss X or X is some issue for the purpose of informing the committee. Now, uh, apparently, I think that would be something they could do, but apparently they don't know they can do that. And maybe there's some, some doubt they could do that, but I think that the right thing to do would be for this to be reformulated as a, as a uh, I think we would tell the committees that they could do that, uh, that committees could uh, make such a motion. So basically I move to refer this uh, standing rule change to the Nipiki Confi Committee. There is a motion to refer 
the standing rules change to the nitpicking and fly spiking committee. That's really meta. Um, there, it has been seconded. Is there anyone wishing to speak on the motion to refer to committee? Seeing none, I'm going to put the question to the floor. All those in favor of referring C.1 to the nitpicking and fly specking committee? All those opposed, please raise your hands. The ayes have it, the motion is referred to the nitpicking and fly specking committee. Now we move on to C2. Harry and Marie Sheher, when are they supposed to report back to this body? Next year. Next year? Does that need to be stated in the... No. <laughs> in fact, technically they don't have to report back. It's now within their remit. But they probably should report back next year. Now we are on to C.2. If you don't have to print it, neither do we. Debate time is set at 10 minutes. Dave, for what purpose does the member rise? No, no purpose. <laughs> is there a speech in favor of the standing rules change? Cliff. Cliff Dunn, still he him. Uh, Mr. Chair, in brief, there was a moment earlier this month, or maybe it was last month, time seems to run together these days, when it looked as though the business meeting was not going to have hard copy agendas. This raised the prospect that there might be an obvious, you know, A, there might be an obvious disconnect between late submitted business having to be hard copy and nothing else being hard copy, and B, the committee not opting to include, in, you know, if late business, if agreed to on the agenda. So I think if, 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 if the ComCom is going to decide not to print off agendas for the business meeting, which may happen in the future, we're not there yet, but it's, I feel like it's coming, I believe it is only fair to tell them to make provision to update the agenda to include those items and not to require people to run off hundreds of copies and kill a couple trees while they're at it. Is there a speech against? Motion to amend. I know, but Elspeth has the motion. To, I I know it doesn't take precedent, but we've been trying to get at this for a while. So, sorry, folks. I can read the congressional record. I can't track this alone. Um, I would like to amend this to say and provide hard copies if possible on the theory that it's running over Kinko's and just after the business meeting and so it would be nice to have them. And my tablet isn't working and I didn't download anything so I'm electronically working without anything. Where would you so, like that text inserted? <laughs> At the appropriate point. <laughs> Trying not to take it more time. Dave said a match to the stove on. Presumably at the end of the first sentence of the added text, Mr. Chair. Kate, can you restate what you just said? At the end of the first statement of the additional text, such that the end of that sentence will now read, the World Health Committee shall be required to properly provide an electronic copy. Uh, microphone! We will restate the me what the member is saying in once the member is finished. Or So here is the amendment that is suggested. It has not yet been seconded. In the event that the WorldCom Committee does not provide printed copies of business to attendees of the business meeting, the requirement in this rule shall be waived 
and the World Cotton Committee shall be required to promptly provide an electronic copy and physical copy, if possible, of any such submitted business to attendees. And then the rest of the added text. Is there a second for the amendment? Second. Is there any debate on the amendment? Is that a speech in favor? Yes. Is there a speech in favor of the amendment? Lisa Hertel, she the this is an access issue. Not everybody can afford having a smartphone or a tablet with a data plan. Not everybody can read electronic text easily. Is there a speech against Kent Bloom? Mr. Chairman, Kent Bloom. Um, I would like to move to refer this to a committee to consider the topic of uh, paper paper copies of the agenda for uh, to be provided to the business meeting, and whether that should become a requirement of uh, of on committees, and in general how that should be done and how electronic uh, copies should be provided. Would you like to state? the named chair of the committee, or are you going to leave that up to me? Oh, I believe I will leave that up to you, because I don't want to open this can of worms myself. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second for the motion to refer to some committee that I get to name? <laughs> Is there any debate on the motion to refer to committee? perry -Ann. This motion, this uh, requirement is not. Oh, Perry Ann will see she heard still. Uh, this requirement is not a requirement for the committee. This is a requirement for the people submitting business. It clearly states that the committee, the business meeting, uh, should provide ready access to the agenda to members attending the business meeting while at the meeting without an additional cost being, per being provided to the attendees. So this has nothing to do with. What the business meeting has to do, it has everything to do with what people submitting business have to do, and I don't think that needs to go to committee. Is there a speech in favor of referring to committee, Ben? Ben Yarrow, he, him. I think the fact that distinguished members of this body have different opinions on exactly what it is that this motion seems to be requiring <laughs> is a pretty good indication that the wording is perhaps not quite as perfected as we would have hoped. And giving a, another committee a chance to figure out what wording we can come up with, that we can all agree what we're trying to require and who we're trying to require it of would be a good thing. Is there any other speech against the motion to refer? Anyone in favor? Joshua? Joshua Cronengold, he, him. Um, it isn't at all ambiguous that this is currently a requirement on uh, the uh, members of this body and not on the Worldcon. However, the current problem, which is clearly a problem, is the requirements on the members of the world of this committee are not aligned with the requirements on the Worldcon. Therefore, we can send it to a committee, and the committee can align the two and produce something that either aligns to so they're both required to provide paper, or they're both required to require to provide the same. And we can make a decision about this in committee. Thank you. Elspeth, for what purpose does the member rise? The wording is 
not ambiguous. It's where possible, but it's not requiring anybody to do anything. Is there anyone remaining wishing to speak on the motion to refer to committee? Seeing none, I'm going to put the question. Should C.2 and any discussion thereon be referred to a committee of my choosing to also discuss the necess necessity of paper copies and the provision thereof of agendas? All in favor, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed? All right, I'm going to say the ayes have it. And Kent, <laughs> you get to be the chair of this committee. <laughs> D Dave, why are you pointing to yourself? You'll take it? Okay, Jesse wants it. I was going to give it to Jess. I I said give it. I was going to give it to them. <laughs> All right, Jesse Lip will be in the chair. Dave, if you want to be on the committee, contact Jesse. Um, yeah, other people can do that. Now that we are done with Section C, I am going to call for a reason. Yes? Next year, if it decides to make a report. Now that we are done with section C, I am going to call for a recess of 15 minutes. We stand in recess until 11.38. Constitutional amendments, beginning with those passed on to us by previous conventions. I say previous conventions because we're going to start with a re-ratification of E. Pluribus Hugo. Is there someone who wishes, the debate time is set at 20 minutes, is there someone who wishes to speak in favor of re-ratification? Be him, and as uh, one of the original sponsors of EPH, I wanted to uh, point out several things. There has been some recent online uh, discussion over file 770 in which I participated. There's also been a uh, note by Nicholas White, which I do recommend, where he was surveying some of the effects of EPH and noting that it has served as a useful tiebreaker in a number of uh, things. Uh, one of the questions that came up in the file 770 debate, and which I, uh, actually, before I get into that, let me just say, I think the overall effect of EPH has been very beneficial. We now have five plus years of experience with it. Uh, we know that it, it has worked reasonably well. But one of the questions that did come up in uh, the file 770 debate was the question of whether or not it is a black box. And since I found that I had done some analysis way back in 2017, based on the published reports, I wanted to share just a little bit of that, how it actually does provide, the, those published reports do provide a little bit of insight that allow us to do spot checking of the results against uh, individual ballots when people have voted for something that was eliminated in one of the final rounds. So uh, the, the fact that you, one can get a certain amount of information about how groups of uh, nominations appear without tracing them to individual ballots unless a member chooses to share that is something that was useful. I wanted to just share a little bit of the analysis I uh, had, and the, and the link to this is on the file set of the discussion, uh, about the kind of information one can get from analysis of the published tables. And this was in the best fan cast category of 2017. I noted, uh, first of all, there were 
this was a category where there were uh, two, they, where the puppies did not s simply bullet vote. In fact, there was uh, one superversive SF had six solo votes and 55 shared two-way votes with Rageaholic. Rageaholic had 21 solo and the 55 shared two-way votes and neither shared any votes with any long list nominee. This was an example of EBH doing what it was intended, reducing this little mini slate to a single entry on the final ballot. In addition, I got a more detailed analysis of the elimination of story logical. And this was just a little hand analysis I did within a few days of the publication of the tables. I know that story logical at the time of its elimination had 14 solo votes, 13 three-way with fans playing, and fangirl happy hour, and 70, seven two-way votes, one with Coot Street, one with fangirl happy hour, one with Team Jeopardy, three with Skippy and Fanny, and one with Family Safe. Now this kind of analysis uh, well, it doesn't identify any individual voter, does offer the opportunity for voters, you know, if, if they're in possession of this information or looking at the tales to do their own analysis, say either, wait, I, first of all, good, I recognize the impact of my individual ballot, and therefore I know that my ballot was counted correctly, or alternatively, wait, my ballot should have appeared in this list and does not, therefore I know my ballot was not counted correctly, and I can prove that by disclosing my individual ballot. So this does offer an opportunity for people to spot check the effects of the EPH without necessarily having to run the whole thing. And so it does, in fact, offer more opportunity for the results of EPH to be checked, at, at least spot checked, so that we know that the algorithm is, in fact, functioning correctly. Thank you. Is is there a member wishing to speak against re-ratification in the colorful hat? Hi, uh, David Kaplan, he, him. Um, I, I believe this method has a drawback in that it decreases the viability of borderline popular works that tend to appear on ballots alongside more broadly popular works. Due to the social phenomenon of stigma management, works by members of racial, ethnic, sexual, or other minorities may be likely to get nominated by members of those groups, who will nominate them alongside mainstream viable works. The voters themselves are not disenfranchised because works they nominated will still become nominees, but in essence, they will be enfranchised only to the extent that their tastes are homogenous with the dominant community. I would like to see these concerns taken under advisement, possibly with a mind towards someone with access to the data and the technical ability to do so, examining results to determine if works by underrepresented minority creators have a greater tendency to be pushed down in rankings by this nominating system. An additional undesirable effect is that uh, this system tends to juggle around results near the bottom end of finalist eligibility in a way that seems arbitrary and which produces results different from approval voting among works for which approval voting results were non-controversial. If this body at any, any future point has an appetite to, again, broadly rewrite the, the rules for Hugo nominations rather than simply refine the e pluribus Hugo method, I would suggest reverting to approval voting for nominations and letting no award results in the final elections point the way to identifying slates. The majority of no award results ever produced were the result of slates. If a category should return a no award result, and unless the Hugo Committee were to make some special attestation that it was not the result of a slate, the nomination process for that category could simply be repeated using the existing ballots but disqualifying the original finalists. This might result in the award being deferred to the next year unless the original voting deadline were made earlier. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of re-ratification. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am Rafe Richards, he in pronouns. EPH was born out of crisis. A crisis which has left its scars on Hugo history in two years of no awards. I should remind people that no awards are not on the whole what we want to see. EPH, together with its sister amendment, five and six, fixed that crisis. If people think that if, the, if, if people think that without EPH, the people who triggered that crisis 
would not come roaring back to take advantage of the weakness that they already know exists. They are far more optimistic about human nature than I dare be. EPH works. If it needs to be tweaked, then let it be tweaked. Do not let it fall. Thank you. Is there a member wishing to speak against re-ratification? Lisa Hayes. Lisa Hayes, she, her. I still believe that E. Pluribus Hugo is a black box. There are only a handful of people here who understand it, and a smaller handful who can actually implement this magic algorithm. We had 4 and 6, which was watered down to 5 and 6, which would have been an adequate block for the puppy problem. I don't want a system still in place that nobody understands, and worse comes to worse, someone has to dig out a Win95 machine to be able to run this silly algorithm because nobody else has lost the other copies. Let's go to something that we can all understand, all agree, and all bet. Thank you. Is there a member wishing to speak in faith, Kate Secor? Kate Secor, she, her. It's not that complicated. I've explained it to lots and lots of people in ways that seem to make sense to them, including people at their first world cons. But look, this is the system that we have. Frankly, as far as I can tell, two people who are not in this room, all right? Can we grant that the people in this room are outliers just a little bit on this matter? It's a black box anyway. Nominations go in, finalists come out. They don't care. We do care. And what we decided after hours and hours and hours of debate in this meeting several years ago and online then, now, and presumably into the future was that this is what we thought the best way to do it was. And now we're going to undo it because people who think the other system is also a black box might think this system is a black box. Can't we just leave well enough alone for once? <laughs> is there a member who wishes to speak against Dave McCartney? <laughs> Get in line. Uh, Dave McCarty, he, him. Uh, I am the, uh, I, I, I am a frequent people administrator and I am the human being on the planet that has put the most sets of data through EPH. I have put nine sets of data through EPH. I have looked at the data and how it works, and I have done the categories by hand to understand things. And I have some points to share. I have previously done this as giant stacks of paper with lots of data, and mostly what I got was glazed eyes, and so I'm not doing that this time. I'm just going to speak for what I know authoritatively. EPH, when it was brought to this body, was promised to do two things. Well, there were two specific promises that were made, there were other promises, but two specific promises that were made that are not true in any way. It was promised that it would take a, a perverse minority of the voters, say 20%, and get their control of the ballot down to, to proportional to them. So if 20% of the voters participated in the slate, they would control 20% of the ballot. EPH does not do that at all. EPH will affect almost all the time, but not all the time, one item in a category. Sometimes, under special circumstances, it will affect a second item in the category. It will not get 20% down to 20%. That never, it was never possible to do that. That promise was false. And it was also promised that it would not give outsized influence to people who, who nominate only one thing in a category, bullet voting. And it, was, it said that bullet voting is not an issue when in fact bullet voting is now the easiest way to hack the Hugo vote and it takes far less people to do it and it has been done both purposely and inadvertently in our five years of experience in this. People accidentally did it and people did it on purpose and it works and it's easy. You don't need very many people to do it and it will get you on the ballot. 
EPH is opaque as the most expert person on the planet in, in, in looking at this data. If I have a Hugo team that's doing it with me, if one of my, if one of my members messes with the data, I have no faith that I could spot that the data has been messed with. It's a black box that even the people running the software cannot validate, especially not in the short amount of time that we have between when the software needs to run and when we need to start communicating to finalists. And most importantly, you know, we, we, uh, we did two things at, in response to the, the puppies. We did EPH and we did five and six. EPH and five and six work against each other. They do in two different directions. EPH, most of the time, is eliminating something from the slate into taking it from one of the top five positions down to number six, which is now still on the ballot. So 50% of the time, EPH is, it is undone by five and six. We're going this way and that way at the same time. When the sad puppies happen, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life had, had advice to this meeting. His advice, and he's sitting in the room, Bruce Schneier, and he and I have had my favorite conversation in 10 years on this topic out on the street. Because for the first time, I had somebody who was, I was talking to that I knew cold understood what I was saying. Bruce Schneier's first advice to this meeting was, first, do nothing. Deliberate. Think. EPH was an emotional reaction out of fear. Five and six was an emotional reaction out of fear. Five and six is at least a demonstrable system that has a provable effect that is not you weren't liked by the right people, which is what EPH boils down to. It's an opaque system that, twiggle, that, that twiggle, twiggles thing in a way that can't really be defended or explained or even audited by anybody on the planet. Thank you. Is there a speech in favor of re-ratification? Yes, in the blue hair. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's teal. <laughs> I am told by the person who has lots of colors that it's teal. <laughs> Joe Van Ekren, she, her. I was deeply involved with all of the discussions in the months leading up to the passage of EPH. It was not something passed out of fear. It was something passed out of a great deal of thought and investigation and discussion. And a lot of things were proposed and worked through. It was well thought through. And I don't know who promised what to date, but here's what was promised to me. It's a disincentive for slates. People knew they could buy $40, $50 membership and get everything they wanted on the ballot. They told us, after we passed the BH, a bunch of them came right out and told us, I'm not going to play anymore because you've made it so I can't take over your ballot. We know EPH works to discourage in that way. And the only reason I was ever willing to support EPH is because it's agnostic. It has nothing to do with being liked by the right people. It's about slaves. It's about not giving outsized representation to one small group of people. It doesn't matter whether you're a leftist, a rightist, a flautist. If, you, if you've got a, sweet, a, a slate, it will deprioritize your slate so that the rest of us have a chance to get something we like on the ballot. And there are people waiting in the wings the moment it ends. If you are able to read the EPH, ratings, they give us more information than we've ever had about nomination process before, before it was just counts. Now we can see how things work out. As Dave Wallace said, you can see where your choice, your last choice drops off and your book gets redistributed. So you can see that it's working. It's, it's an effective way to discourage people from slating and there are still people slating and you can see that in the results. But you can also see how those results get changed and the slates get deprioritized. I really think that this is something we want to keep. It, it's made things a lot more fair. If we get rid of it, we're going to start seeing the process of slates taking over the ballot again. And I really think that this is something we should continue to do. You know what? If we can't trust the Hugo admins to do it right, we might as well just cancel the Hugo awards. 
Okay? It's always been that way. So we have to trust the administrators to do, do things properly. Yes, it makes their job a little bit harder, but I would hope when they take on the job, they know that that's part of it, and they're willing to do that. Please, please vote for ratification of this. How much time is left? There's a motion to call a question and a second. Are there any member, is there an objection? Are, how many members are wishing to speak? All right. The underlying question, there's no debate on calling the question. All those, Two thirds. So two thirds in favor of calling the question. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed? I'm going to say the ayes have it. The question is called. All those in favor of re ratifying. Sorry, I did not hear it. There was a call for division. We know how this works, right? Yes. All those in favor of calling the question, please stand or raise your pink sheet if you cannot stand. Martin, can you stop for a second? Members will be reminded that it's difficult to hear the count if they are chattering. Yes, this is in favor of calling the question. Are there any members still who did not get counted? By my math, the ayes have it. The question is called. All those in favor of re-ratification of E. Pluribus Hugo, please raise your hands. All right. All those against re-ratification, I'm going to say the ayes have it. All right. We're moving on to E2 now. It's on page 8 of the short form agenda. And page 34 of the full agenda. There is six minutes for debate. 
Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of 30 days half new business? Is there any? Oh, is there anyone wishing to speak against the motion? All right, then I'm just going to put the question to the body. See how well. Don, you have an amendment? Point of order, we made a standing rules change requiring a two-thirds vote for acceptance of amendments for dealing with amendments to ratification unless they were pre-printed. Standing rules number. This is standing rule five point five point four. And since I said that really quickly, standing rule five point four motions to amend or a constitutional amendments awaiting ratification must be submitted in advance by the rule two point one deadline. This rule can be suspended by a two thirds vote. All right. So we're going to. State the amendment first. The point of order is correct. We're going to state the amendment. Then we are going to vote to whether to accept the amendment. It requires a two-thirds vote. Then we will vote on the actual amendment. I'm getting there. I do need to breathe sometimes. Deny. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, Andrew Adams, he him. Uh, could I ask the chair to, to be a little more clear? I don't think that his later statement is clear. We require a two thirds uh, positive vote in order to accept even the possibility of debating the amendment. Yes. Right. And, then and then we will debate the amendment and then vote on whether to accept the amendment. You got it exactly right. See, I wasn't that confused. Um, well, maybe I was. I, 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 thought, I thought what you said was confusing. I had to take a minute to understand what you said, and I thought that needed clarification. Yes. Two-thirds vote in favor of debating. Majority vote in favor of accepting should we vote to debate. Don, can you state the amendment? No, at least like, uh, he had, uh, this, when this came up initially last year, uh, I was the chair, and I ruled that this was in the nature of a standing rule and that even if it was in the Constitution, it could be suspended by a two-thirds vote. However, some people have expressed some doubts about that, and in order to make it clear uh, that, that this, when this goes into the Constitution, I intend to move to add to the end that uh, this rule may be suspended by a two-thirds vote. Second. Okay, here's what's happening. We have to take a two-thirds vote in order to put this matter before us. We're not going to ask you all to vote on whether or not to put this before us without knowing what's being put before us and just guess whether or not you want to debate the amendment, because that seems kind of silly. So, Don has just stated what the amendment he wishes to make will be. We are now going to vote per 5.4 to suspend the rules. I will move to suspend the rules if there's a second. Great, it's not debatable, it's not amendable. So then we're going to vote to suspend the rules by a two-thirds vote to take up this amendment, even though it was not submitted before the deadline. Should that two-thirds vote pass, then the amendment, since we've heard a second in the audience already, will be properly before us, and we will continue on the way we would normally do with an amendment. Sound good? Winton stood up.
I'm going to rule that the point of order was on the underlying matter, and we're going to vote now on Winton. Please, can you come up to the microphone? Or Yeah, Winton Matthews, he, him. The question I have is, is whether or not, if this gets passed, and we agree after it's been debated or what have, does that mean that this has to come back next year to China? Or it does it go into the Constitution now? The chair is not going to rule on whether this is a lesser change or a greater change until the body has voted to accept the amendment when we get to debate on the underlying question should we get there and someone asks me that question I will make a ruling all right all those in favor of suspending the rules and accepting this amendment which take up thank you all those in favor of suspending the rules and taking up this amendment, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. All those opposed. I'm going to say that's more than two thirds. All right, the motion has been made and seconded. Don, do you want to make a speech in favor? Knew that was coming. <laughs> you asked me. All right, is this a greater or lesser change? So the chair is going to rule that this is a lesser change and would not require re-ratification by the business meeting at Chengdu as this basically makes the constitutional provision, should it be accepted, clear that it could be suspend the, the rule could be suspended by a vote of two-thirds, which is the rules already in place. So it makes it closer and it makes the provision weaker. Kate Secor. Kate Secor, she, her. I'm going to request that the chair rule on whether this amendment is out of order because the amendment requires a vote of the meeting on things that are happening before the meeting is convened and therefore contravenes the standing rule on not creating time loops. And now the chair is actually going to take five seconds to read the whole sentence and try and parse the English because he was running votes up until now. <laughs> Now that we've had English 101 up here, I am going to rule that the motion or the amendment is in order because it 
allows this body to take up new business that came in after the deadline and was not accepted by the presiding officer, which is the same thing we could do right now if someone were to say, want to bring up a piece of new business right now, the process would be to suspend the rules by a two-thirds vote and take up the piece of new business. That is all this is doing, is adding that to the constitutional provision because it is currently this text is in the standing rules and the standing rules can be overturned by a two-thirds vote. So we're just making it clear that moving it to the Constitution does not change that fact. Make sense to everybody? Yes, thank you. Joni, it doesn't make sense to you. No, so you're adding a microphone. Joni Bill Dashoff, she, her, you're adding a modifier at the end of an entire paragraph. From my understanding, you're only trying to modify the last sentence. Can we break it into two paragraphs so the modifier is clearly only modifying the agenda order? We could if Don is willing to take that. Okay, so, so then what we're going to do is the pr at the beginning of the sentence, the presiding officer may accept. Objection to referring to a committee chaired by Mr. Eastlake to report back tomorrow. Ira. Uh, Ira Alexandra, they them. Uh, could the chair kindly remind me when reports of that nature are given? in the agenda order. So because this is in E, and hopefully, maybe we'll be beginning F tomorrow, I would rule that this item would come up first after site selection tomorrow, and then we would begin with F2, because we decided we were going to start with F2 and not F1, and then we would go through F1 and so on, because the, right, anything that was postponed until Sunday would already be on Sunday. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes. All right. Is there any objection to referring to committee to report back tomorrow? Kate. Hello, everybody. Kate Seacor, she hurts. We've got 15 minutes left today. We've got no, we have 45 minutes 45 left minutes. today. Awesome, we have 45 minutes left today. We have, however much we have tomorrow, we have a lot of business. This is not, I think, all that complicated of a change. If we could, as a matter of personal privilege, please have it up on the screen. I believe we could probably debate it today and just knock it out and get it done. We've got so much to do tomorrow, people. Please don't add another report to it. Y yes. There's going to be a speech that was speech against. We're going to have a speech in favor. This automatically gets four minutes of debate time. It gets. Go ahead, Don. Uh, wordsmithing takes time, and when done under the pressure of the entire meeting here, tends to have errors. Uh, it means a fairly simple uh, operation. I think kids uh, understand what is desired, and I'm sure we can come back with the wording which reflects that desire correctly tomorrow. Is there anybody else wishing to speak against the motion to refer? Any 
Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to put the question to refer to committee to the body. All those in favor of referring to committee chaired by Don to report back tomorrow and to be taken up before any items beginning with the letter F, raise your hands. All right, all those opposed? The ayes have it. If you would like to be involved in the committee, please contact Don. E3, the Statue of Liberty play. Page 8, up. Oh, we need to take one short pause for the camera. All right. There is 12 minutes of debate on this item. Is there anyone wishing to speak? in favor of ratification of the Statue of Liberty play. Anyone wishing to speak against? Joni? While Joni walks to the microphone, the chair will remind people that we don't need to have substantive debate against it, or on things. It may just, uh, Joni Grill, dash off, she, her. This may just be a point of information. Are we still collecting postal information but saying it doesn't have to be passed on? And the reason I raise this question is email addresses can be created without being linked to a real person. If you are asking for a postal address, you are confirming that person exists in real time and place. I'm going to say that the text of the I'm going to say that the text of the motion allows the Worldcon committees to either collect postal information or not because they are not required to pass it on, therefore they are not required to have it. That does not direct them to stop collecting it. it is there any debate? Is there any speech in favor of ratification? Any speech against? Seeing none, I will put the question to the body. I will read the constitutional amendment to amend section 2.7 membership pass along. To read, within 90 days after a Worldcon, the administering committee shall, except where prohibited by applicable law, forward to the committee of the next Worldcon its best information as to the names and contact information of all its Worldcon members who have given permission for that data transfer and only for the purposes for which permission to use that data was given. All those in favor of ratifying E.3, please raise your hands. Hands down, all those in favor, or all those opposed. Can, okay, the motion, <laughs> the motion passes, the uh, constitutional amendment is ratified and will become part of the Constitution at the close of this convention. E.4, a matter of days. There is four minutes for debate on this matter of business. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of E.4? Anyone wishing to speak against? Seeing none, I will put the question to the body. I've been asked not to read it because it's long. Do, we, do I need to read it for anyone? No? Good. All those in favor of ratifying E.4, raise your hands. Hands down. All those opposed? The ayes have it. E.4 is ratified and will become part of the Constitution at the end of this convention. E.5 is on page... Okay, I'm giving this... Secretary, a second. E-5 
you've got five is on page nine of the shortened agenda and 35 of the full agenda. There are 20 minutes of debate time. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of Elspeth? Is there anyone else? Ben, do you wish to speak in favor? Ben Yellow, he, him. What this amendment does is it essentially splits apart the right to attend the annual meeting of the society with people's membership in the society. It says that if you believe in the society's activities, you get to join the society. You then get to pay a supplemental fee if you want to attend the annual meeting of the society. But joining the society says you really believe in the society. And that part sticks with you for life. And there's some minor tweaks to deal with death, um, which is beyond the purview of the society, actually. <laughs> we don't control that. Um, world cons have always had the right to do this. Uh, this simply changes it from an optional thing that world cons can do to something that is mandatory. Is there anyone wishing to speak against, correct? My name is John Lorenz. Uh, this is this is creating a division which does not exist. The members of WISPAS are the members of the Worldcon each year. There is not a separate organization that you join and then possibly pay more to go to the convention. You join the convention and that, that puts you into WISPAS for that year. There is a long tradition of people being able to sell their memberships if they cannot attend or if they cannot afford them. Um, this takes away that tradition. As a pre-reg person's handle, pre-reg for World Cons and Hugo administration, this makes that job more difficult. And the only, the only effect I can really see is it maximizes the income for it the convention that year. It does not help the individuals whatsoever. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in favor? I saw Andrew first. Andrew Adams, he him. In 2020, Conzulin had the unfortunate situation of having to change from an in-person convention to either a number of different options. Uh, in doing so, we decided to adopt a virtual convention. At that point, we were faced with, and I as the head of finance will tell you, a, a horrible set of decisions, uh, partly to do with finance and partly to do with membership statuses, etc. To some extent, I'm slightly, uh, don't care which way we get clarity on this issue. This is one way, the other way would be to, to clarify the other way, that you can transfer the supporting membership. But as somebody who had to be involved in making multiple really hard decisions at the same time, this was another really, this was another really hard decision that I wish we hadn't had to make. And it would help to have clarity for that. So if you don't want this one, please codify the opposite. Please don't leave it up to the individual committees faced with horrible decisions anyway, um, as I hope no one else is faced with the sorts of decisions we have to make, please give us clarity on this so it's not something that we get beaten up about by members 
um, because we had to make the decision. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Mark. Mark Roth and pronouns are irrelevant for me. Um, Ten years ago, I bought a membership from someone. Uh, maybe people don't remember the old days when we had packed rooms, six and eight and ten people to a room because that's all we could afford. There's a lot of people who are not well off, who only find at the last minute or maybe six months before, maybe I can afford World Cup or maybe I can't. They don't know. We've been worried about the graying of fandom for years, I like said, looking over all the gray hair. Uh, this new fans coming in will not get it. They will not understand this. Most of them, look how many people are here. Most people will not get it until it hits them. Uh, I think this is a personal attack against people with low incomes, with no incomes, on fixed income. In fixed income like me, um, this is, if there was an opposite to the E. Everett Evans Big Heart Award, a Small Heart Award, this would win hands down. No. You pay, you're a member. That's all it should be. This is unfanish. Uh, Is there a member wishing to speak in favor, Kate Secor? Okay. Kate Secor, she, her. So we've had the emotional arguments, and we've had the philosophical arguments, and we've had some of the practical arguments. So let's talk about what this actually does. What it does is it says, you join the society, and your membership in the society gives you Hugo nomination, Hugo voting, and participation in site selection rights, and the right to advance business. And then you get an attending supplement, and that's what lets you into the big party with the 5,000 people in it. People may think this is complicated. I'll point out that there are thousands and thousands of professional societies that many young people are actually part of that work in exactly this way. If you are a member of IEEE, you get to be a member of IEEE whether you go to their annual meeting or not. As someone who has done site selection and knows several other people who've done it and several Hugo administrators, the whole transferring rights bit is a nightmare. Because if you have, because what happens is that you take the, I forget how this works, you take the first set of nominations the last and the last set of Hugo votes and the last set, the first of sites like if I transfer my membership after using some of my rights, how does the person who's getting it know what rights they're getting? They don't. How does the convention track which rights they still have? Well, we hope they're tracking that right, don't we? Wouldn't it be simpler to just say, you get a membership in the society, it comes with rights, if you want to come to the party, here's the thing that lets you come to the party. That bit's still transferable. That bit's transferable basically infinitely. Go ahead. You don't want to come to the party? You decide you can't afford to come to the party? Sell your ticket to the party. But we keep saying we're a club, and we keep saying we're a community, and we keep saying that you know we are fandom, and yet we have no commitment to the notion that we are a society, that we are a club that has values and has rights and has things that come with it. This just codifies that notion and makes it easier on a practical level to execute that. Is there a, mo a member wishing to speak against Harry Ann? Harry Ann Marie, she, her. What this does is make the memberships that we have bought less valuable because we cannot transfer the parts of it that the people might want to buy. They will have to pay more and they will pay us less if we decide to sell our memberships. I think this is a terrible idea. We've been doing it the way we've been doing it and somehow they've managed to do it. Uh, however difficult it may be for the people administering it, they can do it. And I think we should keep doing it the way we've been doing it. Mark, you have a point of information? This does not make clear whether the Whispers business meeting will be required to be uh, virtual or uh, hybrid. 
and the additional costs on that. That has no bearing on this. I, the chair. Yeah, I'm going to rule that point of information is not germane. Is there any member wishing to speak in favor of ratification? Ron? Ron Oakes, he, him. As both a member of the committee that proposed this and a former Hugo database administrator, I fully support this. One key point, this does very little to change your ability to transfer an attending membership, or as it will now be called, a attending upgrade. You can still sell that at, as you wish. The only difference is you will need to assure, ensure that the individual you are transferring it to has a WISFIS membership, formerly a supporting membership. If you were selling your attending upgrade for less than what you paid for your supporting membership, you were losing money yourself. At no time, as I understand it, in the last 20 or more years, has a Worldcon been allowed to sell a supporting membership or a WISFIS membership, which have essentially been the same thing, just under a different name, for less than the site selection fee. As to the point of the cost of the WISFIS membership or attending membership and the ability to bring in new fans, the attempts to lower that cost are a separate issue and have been derailed probably more by events that happened in 2015 and 2016 and to a lesser extent by the cost to the convention to administer those memberships than by any desire to expand fandom. And they are unrelated to this issue, which is to clarify what a WISFIS membership or supporting membership means and to make it much easier for those of us who have to administer the data related to the Hugo Awards the data related to membership and the data related to site selection, which can be extremely complicated when, as Kate pointed out, somebody who has used some of their rights attempts to transfer that membership and we have to untangle what rights belong to the previous member, what rights belong to the new member. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak against If there is a motion to call the question. It, is there any objection to calling the question? Objection. There is an objection. How many people wish to speak, either for or against? All right. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. Hands down. All those opposed? Yeah, I'm going to say the no's have it. The question is not called. That was a speech in favor, so a speech against ratification. Lisa.
I discovered that either I completely misunderstood them or they completely misexplained it. I don't know which one. I have to vote against this because this is confusing the hell out of me. The, the member has already yielded the floor. The already yielded the floor. Is there a speech in favor of that? The man in the... <laughs> Thanks. My name is Dave Howell. Um, Dave, can you stoop down just a little bit? I know... My name is Dave Howell. Uh, he, him for pronouns. Uh, I actually dropped by the meeting. Um, I, I read a bit of the, the issue, but I hadn't been paying that much attention to it. So I came on this quite cold. Um, but it seemed very clear to me very quickly. Currently, I have a game at home that I bought an expansion for, or I, I have the expansion. I don't have the game. I was not at all confused when I bought the expansion. I'm like, well, I'll have to get the game eventually in order to put them all together. I don't think any of in fact, it's got any problem with the idea, oh, here's the attending expansion, but you'll need to have the membership to attach it to. That's a really easy idea to get. I do think I would be really confused if I bought a membership and it said it came with all these rights and then I discovered some of them were being bounced on. That would be very upsetting. So I don't, I, this seemed like a, a, a pretty easy thing to wrap my head around even though I came on it cold. Is there a member wishing? Up from speaking against ratification? Hello, Karina Stark, she, her. Um, I believe as written, it is unclear whether an attending supplement can be transferred to a person who is not a WISFIS member. That may result in people attending the conference that do not have the right to attend this business meeting or vote in site selection, which would basically create two classes, a have and a have not. I think if it were amended to include that you may only transfer an, according, uh, a, a, an attending supplement to a WISFIS member, it would put a burden on the new attending member to then purchase a $40, uh, what was formerly been known as a supporting membership, but it would be more clear. It would still allow you to transfer the part of the membership that is attending the conference or not, um, and any other things that are not currently clear, I think, would be cleared out by, attending, by um, inserting that particular uh, clarification into this rule. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of Terry? Terry Neal, she, her. Um, I've been on the registration staff for a couple of world cons and I am currently uh, on the registration staff for Glasgow and I've also been on the Hugo staff um, and uh, implementing this so that you cannot purchase or transfer an attending supplement without already having um, a WISPUS membership is not difficult, and uh, Glasgow is prepared to do that if you, if you ratify this. Um, it's easily done on, on the registration system. Is there anyone wishing to speak against ratification? Joni. Thank you, Martin. Joni Brill Dashoff, a big world con treasurer, site selection. This does not specify what the rights are retained or originally contracted for by a basic membership. If we would specify it's the voting rights for site selection and Hugo, which when we previously sold attending memberships from one to another, that is the tracking that's driven everybody crazy, whether site selection, Hugo admin, or registration. But I'm even more than that, I am truly confused. Right, the basic membership comes with voting rights. And we have been trying to say that the person who originally bought them retains those voting rights is only selling the 
ability to attend in person to another one. Why are we asking that person to already be a basic member where they can vote themselves? I thought we were transferring to somebody brand new the entire ability except for the voting rights. This doesn't clarify the situation at all. I'm going to ask for a time check. For what purpose does the member? How many people are we really talking about every year? Hundred, tens, hundreds, or thousands? Well, if it's a debate and there's only 10 people, or 20 people, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. If there are 100 people, it might be a problem. If there's a thousand people. Debate. That I'm going to rule that you're out of order because this is debate. I was trying to determine if you were going to speak in favor, in which case I was going to allow you to continue. Yes, and, but had you continued your debate in favor, I would have allowed you to just keep the floor, but the point of order is debate, and your debate was not at the time for that side of the argument. Does that make sense? The, the question is debate. If you want to ask the question when it is time for a speech against, that is fine. And if there is someone in the room who can answer it, they could answer it. I can't. But that question is not a speech in favor, it is a speech against, and we are on a speech in favor. Is there any member wishing to speak in favor? Kevin. Kevin Stanley, he, him. My late father-in-law was a veterinarian. He was a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association, AVMA. Occasionally, he went to the AVMA annual conference. But just because he was a member of the organization didn't mean he got to get into the conference. He had to pay the convention supplement. A ticket, if you like to attend the conference. Now, if he had purchased that ticket to attend and then changed his mind, he could have transferred it to anybody he wanted to. But that person would not have been allowed to get into the convention unless they were already an ABMA member. And therefore, that person they transferred it to. We could, the, the transfer is a private agreement between the individuals of the ticket, if you like. And then that person, if they were already an AVMA member, they could go on in. Otherwise, they would have to become a member of AVMA. So it would be sort of foolish to buy one if you weren't. The member's time has expired. Is, expired. Is, we have the room until 1 o'clock. There is still time remaining against. Mr. Olmstead, would you like to ask your question now? Said, the question I ask is, how many people are we really talking about? If it's only 10, even I can handle 10. I've, I've owned companies before with lots of confusion. It's, you build it into your system. Terry, can you answer the question? Yes. Terry Neal, she, her, and I cannot answer your question with specific numbers, but it is sufficient that it is a pain in the ass. 
Will that help? <laughs> okay, I do not have specific numbers. Is, is there any member wishing to speak in favor of ratification? Time has expired. Time has, is there any member wishing to speak against? Cliff. A lot of people buy a lot of people buy the underlying membership not to exercise any of the underlying rights except to attend the convention. When things happen, such as a convention going fully virtual or major policy changes with respect to the convention, maybe something with masks and vaccination and so on and so forth, the underlying purpose for them buying that membership evaporates. This is not any act of bad faith on their part. They wanted to come to a convention. Now, to a, to a policy change, they can't. Were this to restrict the transfer of memberships where rights had been partially exhausted, I would be in favor of it. Because it is the partially exhausted rights which are causing most of these problems. However, where none of the rights have been exhausted, they never voted in the Yugos, they never voted in site selection, etc., I don't see the problem. So while I understand where this motion is coming from, I very much believe that if somebody has not exhausted any of their business rights, they should be able to transfer the whole shebang to whomever, wherever, and wash their hands of this. Thank you. Is there any member wishing to speak against? Perry Ann? I too was a member of multiple, Perry Ann Marie Sheher. I too was a member of multiple professional organizations, and you could in fact attend their conference without being a member. You paid a little extra, there was a discount for members of the organization to attend. But you can attend without being a member. And we have people here who are not members because they have one day memberships, or they have child <laughs> memberships. They're not members of WISPIS, they have no WISPIS rights, but they're at the convention. Are there any member, Lisa? Uh, first of all, I want to confess that I'm Lisa. very confused by the last Lisa, paragraph. Lisa, can you state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Lisa Hertel, she did it. I, I want to confess I'm very confused by the last paragraph, uh, but it seems to me that this change benefits the SMOS and does not benefit most attendees. Are there any members remaining wishing to speak against? Seeing none, I will put the question to the body. The question is on ratification of E.5, non-transferability of voting rights. All those in favor of ratification, please raise your hands. Hands down. All those opposed? I'm going to say that no, there's a call for division. All those in favor of ratification, please stand or raise your pink cards. All those opposed, please stand or raise your cards.
That's 40 votes against. Are there any members who do not believe their votes were counted? Seeing none, the ayes have it by a count of 46 to 40. The motion is ratified. Given that we are at seven minutes till one, I am going to move that we go into recess until tomorrow, or adjourn for today until tomorrow, at which point we will take up the report from the committee handling E.2. Yes, first we'll do site selection, then we'll do E.2, then we'll go into F.2, and then through the rest of the F items. All right? We are in recess at 12.54.